Hey ladies and gentlemen, it's Steve here. Before we get started this week, I want to let you know that on BJJ Mental Models Premium, we just launched an awesome three-part series with four-time world champ Dominica Obelinite. It's about competition and the crushing emotional pressure that can go along with it. Critical listen for anyone who's a competitor or really anyone who works in a high-stress environment. Give it a shot, premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. You can check it out and get a free trial. Give it a listen. If you don't like it, cancel with no risk. Again, premium.bjjmentalmodels.com and enjoy the show. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models episode 156. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. And today... Happy to be joined by Christina Barlon. Christina, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me. You are most welcome. I've been looking forward to having you on for a while. And <laughs> I thought today would be a fun day to talk about how to choke people. Yeah. Does that sound good? <laughs> it's always a good day to choke people. <laughs> yeah. My understanding is that's your specialty. We were talking beforehand about topics and you mentioned an affinity for the bow and arrow choke. And yes. I thought that would be a fantastic thing to get into. Oh, definitely, definitely. There's so many ways it can go about it. <laughs> awesome. Well, before we do, maybe a quick intro. Why don't you tell everyone who you are? Okay. Uh, Christina Barlon. I am a second degree black belt under Professor Kayoteha. Been training for over 14 years. I started with Muay Thai first and then, you know, I were at Caesar Gracie's Academy and then, you know, fell in love with jiu-jitsu along the way. And now that's all I've been doing since 2007. And like, really, I didn't fall in love with jiu-jitsu until... Kaioteha came into the picture. I mean, I saw how he was, how he was training and, and what he was doing. I was like, man, he's like a little guy. He, he's really little. He's like my size and he's able to do all these things. Like these guys are huge, right? And he's like sweeping them and choking them and submitting like it's nothing. I'm like, I want jujitsu like that. And ever since then, I've just pretty much like, I want to have that jujitsu. So I learned under him and now here I am like almost 14 years later and it's like, <laughs> what a ride. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's interesting. So you had a pretty good understanding of the uh, landscape of jujitsu if you knew who Cal was before you started. Because when I went into jujitsu, I went in pretty much stone cold. I didn't know anything about it at all. And it was just by ambling through as a white belt that I started to pick up who these names were. So you must have done a lot of research. Well, I was actually one of his first students when he first came to the U.S. So no one knew uh. who Kaya was. The only person who knew who Kaya was was Caesar Gracie because he brought him in to teach at the academy. So I was a brand new white belt and he was pretty much a brand new black belt. You know, that was like he got his black belt and he moved to the U.S., to start his new life to teach and and he landed at Caesars and I was one of his first students. So I also did not know who he was. Like Caesar was just like, he's a metal farm. He's won everything. I'm like, Caesar, I don't know what that means. He's like, he's <laughs> won everything. And he got and he got his black belt super quick. He's a stud. He's like a phenom. I'm like, okay, Caesar, whatever you say, but like that little guy over there, he looks like an Abercrombie model. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, Caesar. <laughs> Are you sure? And then, then that's when like I saw the jujitsu and I was like, oh man, this is like, that's real jujitsu. That's not like, there's no strength. There's no athleticism. There's just pure technique. Yeah. I want to do that because that looks like wizard stuff. Like straight up looks like magic. And I, I was in, I was like, I, I didn't even sign up for jujitsu until, until I started learning with him. Cause other than that, I would maybe hop into class every now and then like, Oh yeah, you know, this jujitsu stuff is kind of fun when I want to, you know, take a break from Muay Thai every now and then, you know, but once, once Kayo came in, I was like, yeah, I'm, I don't think I'm going to do Muay Thai anymore. I think I just want to do <laughs> jujitsu. You know, before we get started, maybe I would love to, I'd love to pick your mind on this because one of the things about jujitsu is that it's got this weird for lack of a better term, it's got almost like an intoxicating factor on new people. I've never seen anything like it in my life where people try jujitsu and then within about two days, it's the only thing they can think about. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I, I find out one of actually the most important things that they don't tell you about when going from the white to the black belt journey. One of the things that no one tells you about is that a big part of jujitsu is learning to build a healthy relationship with it. Oh, uh, yeah. Because when, when you are a white belt, I mean, I remember when I was a white belt and a blue belt, I was 
training like 14 times a week, which doesn't sound like a lot if you're a pro, but I was a hobbyist, you know, I was doing yeah. this just for fun and I was training that much and it, it kind of became all consuming. And it's not until you've ingrained jujitsu into your life and it's been something you've been doing for years that you eventually kind of get what I would call a healthy relationship with it. But I would love your perspective on this. Why do you think that is that it just takes over people's lives the way that it does? Oh man. It's like, now that you think about it, I'm like, it never took over my life. And then like, I'm thinking back to when I was a white belt, <laughs> me changing my work schedule literally so that I could go to more daytime classes. Like, yeah, I was yeah. a little obsessed. I was like, Oh my God, I really was. It really took over everything. Like, and, and, and in the best way possible, like in order for me to even start training, I had to break up with my, like, I had to break up with my boyfriend at the time. It was like a toxic relationship. And I think that's, that's the big part of what jujitsu is. It's like, it's super empowering. Like yeah. once you feel that, like, oh my God, I feel kind of like, like a badass, you know, at least for me, for me, I felt super confident. I felt super empowered. Like I did not think I could feel that powerful or that strong, you know, like, I mean, I was doing Muay Thai. I was like, okay, cool. A punch, a kick. Right. You get like the instant wham, bam. But like after a while, you kind of, you kind of have this feeling where, like, I actually don't like being punched or kicked. Um, <laughs> Fair. and then, yeah, you know, and in jujitsu, you don't get punched or kicked, but you know, you get kind of pushed in a certain way. And I don't know, like in my head, I'm just kind of like, well, I can, I can just fight through that, you know, and, and that part of my, my brain clicks. I'm just like, oh, that, that feels, that feels like really, really like, I could do that with anything, right? Like I can just fight through that, like anything in life. I wanted to keep going simply because of how good it made me feel. I, yeah. I, I you know, you're coming from, again, I'm a small person. I'm, I'm not that big. I'm not that strong. And considering where I was in that point of my life, which was, I was starting to try to make my way up. You know, I was in school, I had a job, but I was in this toxic relationship. And that was the really big, like the weight on the ankle, right? Like that just really kept me from like going forward in life. And once I got a little taste of jujitsu, it was like, man, I really don't need to hold on to this weight that like it's holding me back. Like this person's not good for me. But yeah. this sport is gonna be really good for me. Like I I didn't even know at what capacity. I just knew. I'm like, I really feel like okay, I feel like I can be good at it, but I feel like this could be really, really good for me. And I just mm -hmm. ran with that. And I think that's what a lot of people kind of relate to is like, I think this could be really good for me. Like they may not necessarily be good at it, but will it be good for me? I think we get that right off the bat because it's a different feeling of like, yeah, you're going to be rolling and sometimes you feel a little helpless, but like never to the point where you don't feel out of control. At least yeah. I, you know, and, and once you feel like you can have a little bit of control, I, I feel like that's something that most people are looking for is some semblance of control in their life. And this is one of those things that jujitsu can kind of if either not give you in the first time, it, it shows you that it's possible, you know, obviously we don't want to be control freaks, but like just knowing that like, Hey, I can make it through this, through this part right here, or I can, I can push someone to that point. That's get really addicting. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think there's two sides to that coin. Like you said, there's the the confidence that it gives you and the fact that it teaches you to feel like you can control situations that seem uncontrollable. But the other thing it does, and I mean, this is kind of the first thing jujitsu beats into you, is it teaches you that even in the times when you don't have control, it's okay and you can still survive it. Oh, yeah. That's one of the things that I, I started to feel when I I took jujitsu. A lot of the things that used to bother me a lot stopped bothering me after I began training jujitsu because my thought was like, look, no matter how bad the day goes, I'm going to go and get locked in a dungeon and get choked out by a bunch of people at 6 p.m. tonight. So nothing that happens in my desk job could possibly be worse <laughs> than that. Right. So if I can get through that, I can get through anything. So there's a it's, it's a very good tool for building up resilience and just the fact that you can actually train in an intense sport that's actually incredibly safe and still effective it it's kind of just the the sweet spot in the middle of what all of the martial arts promise there's a lot of martial arts that just aren't as effective as they purport to be there's a lot that are effective but you're getting punched in the face but man jiu-jitsu is a a great way to slow it down and learn to take care of yourself without having to actually go and hurt yourself or your opponent right it's a very good safe way and i think i think the fact that it is mostly safe is part of a, the comfort that it gives to people when they're training right like you're not getting struck in the face and that makes it more more palatable and easier to integrate into your life 
Oh, definitely. I mean, I, it just the fact that how accessible jujitsu is to anybody. I, I tell us anybody, like, you know, like you can start literally at any age, you know, obviously like for as long as you're like, you can comprehend and, and you can pay attention in class. Right. I mean, people are like, Oh, I'm 30, I'm 30 something. I'm 40 something. I'm 50 something. Is it too late for me to start jujitsu? I'm like, absolutely not. You can start whatever you want. You know, like if you want to start it, go ahead and start it because literally you can start at any age and you can make jujitsu fit to whatever it is that you know, is that you're capable of, right? If, yeah. if you have some hindrances, like if you have an injury, if you had a surgery, if, if you have, you know, physical capabilities, you know, that are different from somebody else, like you can make jujitsu work for you. And yeah, it, it, like it, it's, I don't feel like you're limited. Like, again, you don't have to be in shape to start jujitsu. You could start pretty much however we come in, you know, you don't have to be strong. You don't have to be big you don't have to be athletic you don't have to be you don't necessarily even have to be in the best shape you know because you get into shape when when you start when you do it you know and you don't have to be an, a mega athlete or you don't have to be a competitor like if you just want to do it for fun you can do it for fun and and that's a cool thing too is like if you do want to compete that's still also available to you like if you're 50 you're like i want to try to compete i'm like yeah dude you could totally compete and I, I would 100% feel comfortable telling my student who's like 50 years old, like, you know, maybe even a white belt, like, yeah, you can totally compete with confidence knowing that they would have a good, they would have a good experience and they wouldn't get hurt and they would leave feeling really accomplished. Like, I don't think there's many sports, especially combat sports, where you could tell that to somebody, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I agree. I am not a sports guy. I've never really been into sports my whole life. I used to, I, I really don't enjoy sports at all. I don't even like watching them. But jujitsu really resonated with me. It, it is funny because like I just I'm not a sports guy. I don't even watch competition jujitsu. And so I think sometimes <laughs> people are blown away by how ignorant I am. Like I'm a black belt and I run this very well known podcast. I don't know anything about the competition scene unless someone tells me about it and says, Steve, you should interview so and so or you should go check this out. I just for me, it's it's a hobby. It's something I do. And I just don't enjoy watching other people do my hobby. I want to do it myself. <laughs> but yeah, it's just it's weird how jujitsu is so versatile in terms of how it it doesn't just appeal to one type of person. There's a lot of other sports where I think you you have to very much have an athlete mentality or a very competitive mentality mentality to get something out of it. But jujitsu, you can you can make it a staple of your life and have no interest in competing and you'll still get a lot out of it. Right. And for that matter, you can actually usually still put up a decent fight against the competitors, too, which is the cool thing. So it it is very empowering in that way. One of the things I love about it. Anyway, there's my sales pitch for jujitsu. If anyone <laughs> for some reason is listening to this and actually doesn't train, that is the sales pitch for the day. But I guess now we should probably talk about the sales pitch for the, the bow and arrow choke, Christina. Oh um, hey, I got to ask, are, do you consider yourself primarily a gi person or do you cross train gi and no gi and kind of do whatever? I'm definitely a gi lover. I <laughs> like I love my pajamas. There's more to hold on to. And and the funny story, it's like if it wasn't for the gi, I probably would not have fallen in love with jujitsu the way that I did. Like yeah. literally the first time anyone showed me a new jujitsu was no gi. And I was brand new into Muay Thai. And they're like, Yeah, this is an arm bar, this is triangle, this is this is a sweep. And I'm like, okay, that looks kind of cool, I guess. And, you know, then they tried having me like roll with some like the Nogi guys. They had like another girl there that was like, she was like a wrestler. And then they had me try rolling with her. And I'm just like, this doesn't make any sense. Like you're telling me I don't have to have, the, I don't have to be big or strong or athletic, but like, this doesn't make any sense. I, I don't think this jujitsu stuff is for me. Like I <laughs> literal words out of my mouth. I don't think this jujitsu stuff is for me. And then it wasn't until like a year later where my teammate was like, here, Try class again. I'm going to let you borrow my gi top. I think it could be really good. I think you're going to like it. I'm like, I don't know, Virgil. I'm like, all right, I'll do it. And um, yeah, that literally was the difference. I put the gi on. I'm like, oh my God, why wasn't I doing this the entire time? <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> Yeah, for me, I mean, I, hey, I got nothing against no gi. I understand the importance of training no gi, but honestly, I, I much prefer the gi for a variety of reasons. Um, one of them just being, I, I think that if you're actually interested in jujitsu from a self-defense standpoint, you have to train with some understanding of how to how to deal with people grabbing your clothing. It's oh, just yeah. a fallacy just to just think that you can defend yourself if you can't deal with someone trying to hooligan you and pull your shirt over your head, right? You need to be able to to deal with that. You don't necessarily need to be able to squid someone or spider guard <laughs> someone, but you do need to be able to understand how someone grabs your clothing. I also think that when it comes to nogi, 
it honestly doesn't make a very good first impression. You know, when you go onto someone's Nogi page and you watch people sparring Nogi and you just see these two people just like flailing and flying all over the place and they're literally soaking wet and they're like yeah, no, sparring yeah. in a puddle of their own sweat. I mean, <laughs> it is the most disgusting thing to, to imagine. Every time I see those, those videos of people sparring and they're just like suplexing each other and just flying all over the place and they're just, oh, they're like in a, a puddle of their own filth. It's it's pretty nasty, <laughs> honestly. I mean, I, like I said, I'm, I know that there's, I'm not going to say that it's a bad sport. I mean, I, I train Nogi. There's nothing against Nogi, but it is disgusting. Yeah, <laughs> so. no, no. I, I feel the same way like i i don't have nothing against training nogi either like i actually i can enjoy it here's the, it's like the thing is it's like i can enjoy training nogi for as long as i know i don't have to compete in nogi because i don't enjoy competition nogi as much which is really weird because when i grew up or coming up in jiu-jitsu it's like i was all about it. like I, any it didn't matter if it was gi or nogi if i could train i wanted to train it didn't matter but definitely when, as i got in the upper ranks i got a little bit more selective because it's just like yeah you have to be a lot more selective with your training partners and, you know, I'll be like training and then it's like after training, I'm like, oh yeah, this is the reason why I don't like Nogi as much. You know, it's, it's like, yeah. it's gross. It's like, I, I can smell like five other people on my face. It's not me. Oh, boy. Yeah. You know, like, I don't, I don't even know whose hair this is in my mouth right now. I don't like all of this is just like, this is gross. Like, <laughs> I don't enjoy this that much, but like, but also it's like, yeah, like you see more of like, if people have natural attributes like athleticism and strength and speed, like that comes straight to the forefront in no gi, right? Where, you know, but they say gi is the, the equalizer, the, the gi equalizes it. It makes things even. And that's why I fell in love with it in the first place, right? It's like I fell in love with it because I wanted to feel empowered and like, but of course there's an understanding now, like when it, once I trained in the gi and then I went training no gi, I was like, Oh, this makes a lot more sense. But yeah. yeah, the the gi makes it realistic. Like you said, we're not lying to ourselves. Like you have to understand that people are going to grab you. And you also understand that you can grab them too. Like like that was the big understanding or the big difference between Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu for me. Like if I was coming at a self-defense aspect, like, like there's a very, very low chance that I'm going to one punch, like KO somebody, you know, in the head, like with a kick or with a face, like there's no way. If I need to defend myself, I'm going to KO somebody. But 100%, I could put somebody to sleep. And that yeah. doesn't require strength or anything. Like, I could do that for as long as I can get a grip on them. Yeah. Well, I think another important thing to to bear in mind, too, especially if you're a smaller person and you're fighting up weight classes, when you get choked in the gi, with the exception of maybe the guillotine or the Marcelo teen, most of the chokes that you're going to get stuck in in the gi, they don't really feel that terrible to be stuck in. You know, when you get stuck in a triangle or a darse or an anaconda or even a rear naked, it, it's usually kind of a slow burn. You know, it takes <laughs> it takes a, it takes a little bit of effort to choke someone out. And I've definitely been in situations many a time where I just don't have the the power or the leverage because of the length of my limbs to finish the choke. But when you do gi chokes, like especially the bow and arrow, it feels like a decapitation yes. there's something about the leverage that you get off of using the fabric it is not even close to the leverage that you get just with your bare hands and so if you have even the remotest interest in self-defense not knowing how to do things like a bow and arrow choke or a collar choke or any fancy gi choke you know you're you're really preventing yourself from from filling up all your quiver with all of the possible arrows that you could have so i do encourage people especially from a self-defense standpoint to consider the gi now with that said bow and arrow choke how tell me about this how did you fall in love with the bow and arrow because for me it actually took a long time to really appreciate what the bow and arrow was when did you start applying this and what do you like about it versus some of the other options on the table all right so there is a like, I guess I'll say like a long process, but like a process of, I guess, discovery. Cause I didn't know it was called a bow and arrow choke when I first started learning how to do it. And, and the funny thing is, is like when I first learned how to do it, I didn't learn it. Like typically bow and arrows from the back, right? You start from back control. That's where you're going to, you're going to set up your, your bow and arrow chokes. When I first learned it and, and it wasn't even really, I don't say it wasn't taught to me the proper way, but they were just kind of like, yeah, you're going to feed the collar to the other hand. And then you're going to be able to sit back and you're going to be able to choke them this way. And I'm like, okay, cool. Someone showed it to me from Mount. And I was like, oh, cool. What's the name of this choke? And like, oh, uh, I don't know. There isn't a name for it. I'm like, okay, cool. We're just going to call this no name choke number one. 
And that's how it started. It started as no name <laughs> choke, number one, as a white belt. And it wasn't even, I wasn't even learning how to do it from the back. I learned how to do it from the mount, which was like somehow like mounting them, getting the crawler side, right? If I have my right hand, getting it across the collar side, pushing it through so I can get my other hand behind the head and pass that to the other hand. So you have everything set up for how a bow and arrow should be, right? Pulling the neck up and then like, and then somehow just sitting back and grabbing the leg. And so it was so just like, it was ugly. It was, it was not pretty at all, but however way um, it was taught to me and however way I was just like, I was so like, I want to make this choke work no matter what. Like, I'm just going to try to find a way to make it work and I would make it work and it wasn't pretty, but you know, like, I think there's even, I'd have to look on somewhere on YouTube. There is a, there is footage of me doing my no name choke number one, which is pretty much a bow and arrow choke, but it doesn't, it's not set up the way that a bow and arrow choke should be set up, um, mm-hmm. as a blue belt, um, competing at pants, which happens to be the first time I actually won pants, um, 2010. So there's some video of it somewhere on, on, on YouTube. And I was like, wow, this looks really cool. But the, and the difference that I do with my bow and arrow, and if I can do it, there's a few pictures of it is I like to take advantage of, of my flexibility. You know, I always, I always teach like, don't, don't abuse like your, your natural attributes. Like, you know, cause one day you may not have it. So you don't want to, you know, you don't want to abuse it. You don't want to use what you don't have. Or even if you do have it, you don't want to depend on it. But this is one of those things where it's like, well, I could definitely make this choke a lot worse if I add my leg into this. And so, you know, like it's funny because you said something about it's like, it's like being decapitated, right? It's like, and when I teach it in class, I'll be like, yeah, you, you know, so you have to set the bone arrow choke, you're pulling on the collar, you're, gra- you're controlling the leg or controlling whatever it is that you want to anchor yourself on the other side. But I also like to bring the leg, right? The shin right behind the head. And it's like off with their head, you know, it's oh, like, a, little, yeah. it's like the... a nice little decapitating thing. So not only are, am I choking you with my, with your gi and my, my hand is there, but then also have my shin right behind the head. And it's like, it's, it's terrible. It's so terrible. Yeah. There's a lot of submissions that have kind of a, a level one and a level two, you know, like this is the way that I think of it, where you go into the submission and it's, it's sort of tight, but it's escapable or it's survivable but then a lot of submissions have a level two where you can do something to kind of just turn the dial up just a bit and with the bow and arrow what you brought up is a great example um i've done the same thing where if i have a bow and arrow and i've got it but for whatever reason i just can't really finish it you know the guy is trying to homer simpson he's trying to walk around and i can't quite get the leg grip i want man if you have the space and you can put your shin on basically against the near side of their neck. Oh yep. man, it's it, it is rough. That is what I consider to be the the level two variant of the bow and arrow. Where if you get that, now you've got now you've got pressure on both sides of the neck. Right. Yes. The, the bow and arrow is an interesting choke because. With most chokes, you need to have something wedged against both carotid arteries. With the bow and arrow choke, you don't. Nope. But you just have such a deep grip and there's so much rotation on it that it's like a noose. It just, by virtue of the fact that you're just constricting right around the person's neck, what winds up happening is you actually compress both of the arteries. And you can supercharge that if you bring your shin in because now you're driving your shin into the neck too. You just I, you have to be careful doing that because, of course, a lot of the time when you go for that to get your shin in there, you have to make space for a second but once you get the sensitivity and you learn to bring your shin in man it it makes a big difference the other thing i've started doing is i've actually started doing almost like a kneeling bow and arrow where rather you know normally with a bow and arrow the arrow in the bow and arrow is one of your legs right you throw your leg across the person's belly and you sort of do a push pull and your leg is supposed to be the arrow what i do now sometimes instead of throwing my leg across i get up and i knee ride the person with that leg instead and then i bow and arrow from there and that really sucks from what i've been told yeah. <laughs> to have that happen to you so yeah there's just there's so much versatility in the bow and arrow which is one of the things that i just absolutely adore about it yeah like i've i've gotten it too or you know especially when you first learn it they're like okay there's Okay, so think of like back control, right? And then you have like a seat belt grip. And they always, when I teach, it's like, okay, you have an attacking side and escaping side. You have the side that you're most likely able to attack and finish a choke. And that's the side that you want to keep them on, right? That's the side that's over the shoulder, closest to the neck. And then you have the escaping side. That's the side where you have the arm underneath the armpit. And they're more likely to try to escape to that side. Now, the way that I like to do bow and arrow and or at least when, when we're first taught it, we're all taught on how to finish the choke on the choking side, right? The, the side yeah. that the arm is over the shoulder. 
I can bow and arrow on either side. And a lot of this is like, you know, you learn this from, from Professor Kyle. It's like, yeah, either side is a choking side now. Like, so yes. even if they fall to the side where they're most likely to escape, like there's a really, really brutal, brutal bow and arrow choke that's there as well. And you finish it a lot differently because instead of pushing them down and sitting back, it's like you almost just kind of have them sitting on your hips a little bit. And instead of having to bring your leg high up, you just kind of like, put them in the right place so then your leg can go over their shoulder and you lock them in and all you have to do is just kind of extend a little bit. And it's terrible because same thing, you don't need both carotids. You just need the one. Yeah. And the, also the great thing about bow and arrow and the reason why I like bow and arrow so much is because bow and arrow is not just a submission by itself, but you can use a bunch of other things to it with it. So the way that I do bow and arrow on the, the say the escaping side or like the non non finishing side, quote unquote, right? Is even if they happen to escape for whatever reason, which is, you know, going to be very hard to do it. I have my wrist locks. I have, there's like loop chokes in there. There are so many terrible things that can still happen and you still have control over them. In general, it's just a, again, a really good place to be because you can literally look at the lay of the land, right? Yeah. It's kind of like, if you're, okay, I know you don't watch sports. I don't even watch quite a bit of sports, but like, okay, you know, like a quarterback, you know, playing football and they kind of have to sit back and they have to kind of like read the field and they have to figure out what they're going to do with that ball. If they're going to throw it to a wide receiver, they're going to, you know, or if they're going to have to run it. Now, if they have a really, really good defense, right, they can sit back and they can literally look at the field and they have a lot of time to play with, right? They don't necessarily have to act right away because their defense is doing, doing a good job, right? So, that's kind of what bow and arrow choke is for me. Once I have everything kind of set up, I'm like, yeah, I could finish this choke, but let's say they're being particularly resistant or maybe they have a thicker neck or maybe, maybe I missed the lapel underneath the chin just a little bit. I literally can just kind of hang out there and just kind of look at what they're doing and watch them struggle. Right. <laughs> and, 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 and still feel like, Oh, nope, this isn't a problem. Like I don't have to freak out. Like I have. Other submissions I can use and tack with this, or I can also still salvage this position with something else. I have time. I don't have to rush. And that is the beauty of the bow and arrow. Like you don't have to rush to finish it. You literally can just take your time because you don't have to use. It's like very minimal strength and very minimal energy that you have to exert to finish, to finish the choke. You just kind of have to just, I guess, like hang on. But again, you don't burn out your grips or anything. And, and and I think that's what's so appealing about it as well. There's no grip burn. You know, there's a lot of a lot of chokes where you can feel like your grips burn out or your legs burn out or whatever, like, oh, I can't hold on anymore. But with a bow and arrow, you literally can just take your time. And, yeah. and, um, and that's what's great about it. Yeah, you bring up a lot of really good points. One of them being, like you said, the bow and arrow lets you create a ton of dilemmas where you can get the grip kind of set up and then you can let your opponent pick their poison because there's so many things that you can do from there. What I do a lot actually is when I go for the bow and arrow, if the person is really squirmy, I will switch to a, a wing choke, right? Um, uh, Katahajime where I put my, you bring your other arm up and under their armpit. Yes. That's a good one if they're really, really squirmy or if they start trying to sit up or something. So you have so many options from there. You can basically just put your opponent in a situation where there are no good outcomes and if their default choice, if they just sit still, is they're going to get bow and arrow choked. So they're almost certainly going to try to get out because getting bow and arrow choked is pretty much the worst thing that can happen to you in jujitsu. Oh, no. <laughs> so you can create really good reactions out of your opponent. And I think part of the reason why it's so good for this is because unlike most chokes or most submissions even, with the bow and arrow, you really only need one arm engaged in the choke itself. Uh, yes. And that is the, the lapel grip. Your other arm is free to do whatever makes the most sense at the time, whether it be grab their, their pant fabric, underhook the leg, grab the belt, go for a wing choke, switch to a wrist lock. Your other hand is totally free. So you're putting the person in this dire straits with just one hand and your other hand is available to switch depending on the situation. And that's a very unique thing in jujitsu. You don't get a lot of situations like that. Usually the setup for a submission requires you to engage both of your hands and so it's cool when there's an option where you can just basically do a one-arm strangle and your other arm is there to be a, a rudder and to kind of switch position depending on what needs to happen based on where your opponent goes yeah i, I definitely like teaching that way too like you know even like for example we'll, we'll bring in another token triangles like i love triangles too like even like the way that i teach that is like i want you to be able to get this triangle you don't need to lock a figure four you don't need to you don't need to have the longest legs like you just need to have compression on one neck and if you can 
trap one of the arms so that both of your hands are free. So now you have both of your hands to work with. They only have one hand to defend with, and it's not going to be one that's going to, you know, help them. And at the same time, you can have like not just a triangle, but at least two or three other submissions along with that triangle, right? So I like being able to set up submissions. In particular, I like setting up chokes in which you just, you have more than just the one choke, right? They have a lot of stuff to be worried about, and they're not sure. They're not quite sure which one's the one to be more <laughs> concerned about. Like, obviously, there's the, there's the immediate, like, I'm getting choked right now by the bow and arrow, or I'm getting choked right now by the triangle. Like, But then it's really easy to start forgetting that, like, oh, my limbs are exposed. My wrist is exposed. Like, you know, I can be taken this way or that way or, like, like – there's not much you can do. I mean, and, and in this case, like with most bow and arrows, like you have both of your hands to defend with, but it, even still, like I could be choking you and I could still have another hand to maybe if I want to go for a wrist lock or even just have really good hand or wrist control. And that's also going to lead into something else that I can choke you with. And you're not going to be able to do much because I'm so far behind you. Like, yeah, especially when you learn how to like hide your elbows, hide, hide your angles, right? You know, there's definitely ways that like you can improve and make it a lot harder for the person to escape or even defend. Or if they do have options to defend, they're not going to be really good ones, right? It's yeah. kind of like you're kind of hoping that the person will give up before before you can actually find a way to escape yourself. It's like you're, you're kind of at your, they're at their mercy, right? Like Mm -hmm. who's going to win this war of attrition, like either your grip or me just kind of stiff necking. And hopefully I can, you know, pray my way out of this choke. But a lot of times (laughs) it's not going to happen. Yeah. There's some chokes you can pray your way out of, but I find with the bow and arrow, that's not where I want to play that game. You know, if someone triangles me or uh, darces me, I might try to just tough it out, but I know that if someone gets a bow and arrow choke, there is no toughing it out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, no. Yeah, it, it's just such a powerful option. Yeah. At the first time, I, I think this is my only recollection of actually being put to sleep, put to sleep in actual training was a bow and arrow. And I remember yeah. like I was trying to fight out and I'm like, I need to tap. Like I'm not getting out of this. And I remember bringing my hand up to tap. But I guess I just didn't tap in time because the next thing I knew, my, my feet were in the air. I'm looking at the <laughs> ceiling, my body shaking. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Am I like, what's going on? It was so weird. And, you know, my friend's like, Oh my God, are you okay? You fell asleep. I was like, I was like, I thought I tapped. I was like, it's like, you didn't tap in time. I'm like, Oh, that sucks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I had this happen to me as well. I was sparring with this really big, strong dude. I think he had an MMA background or he trained MMA. And I thought, you know, this is going to be a dog fight. This is going to be a bad day at the office for me. But he went to his knees and I bow and arrowed him, which, which is actually one of my favorite ways to bow and arrow people is when they turtle. You know, bow and arrow is often thought of as a back submission. But one of the beautiful things about it is you can score it from anywhere. Yes. So what I did was I, I got or one collar grip while he turtled. And then I swung my leg over top and fell back. And so I couldn't see his face. And I only had him in the choke for what felt like three seconds. But then he started doing the scary convulsing thing. Oh, my God. No. Oh no, what have I done to this poor guy? Yeah, it is. It is a fast and very, very powerful choke, which, again, I think is one of the, the nice things about a lot of the gi chokes is you're not messing around with those. You know, if you get stuck in an arm triangle, it's going to take a lot of time before you actually get put to sleep. But with a lot of gi chokes, especially the bow and arrow, it is a lightning fast submission when it comes on. Yeah, like you feel it immediately. I often, whenever I'm teaching in class, like I, I have to take breaks because sometimes like, and I know this, I'm, I'm notorious. For this. It's not like I'm trying to be mean. I'm not, I'm not a mean professor, I promise, you know, <laughs> but like sometimes I'll talk for a period of time and I'm like, and explaining the position like, okay, this angle, you want to push them down this way. You want to make sure you're not behind them, but you want to, you know, you want to be a little bit off to the side and then hide your elbow, you know, all these little details. And then I'll forget that like, oh, this choke is locked in. From the very beginning, I was like, yeah. oh, I was like, I'm going to loosen this grip real quick. And then, you know, the uke will be like, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I was like, you know, I'm like talking and forgetting, like seeing like the changing color of their face, you know, from like normal to like pink to like red to like purple. Like, oh, no. You know, and like, so having to catch yourself, like, because, you, you know, like even, even when you're not, even when you're not trying to submit the person. It's so tight. Exactly. You can still very much put them to sleep because... Again, if you have the grip in the right place, even if you're not pulling back and you're not trying to finish, it's very much possible to still put somebody to sleep. And uh, so, you know, if you're practicing it at home, if you're listening, if you're practicing it at home or you're trying to explain it, just be aware, check up on your buddies. I always tell my, tell my students all the time, check up on your partner, make sure that they're okay. 
you know, because you know, that, that grip can get it strong right away. Like they'll feel it immediately. So just check up on them. Say so no one goes to sleep. <laughs> yeah. I always, I always dread when it's bow and arrow day at class, because, you know, if you have some white belt banging out 30 reps of a bow and arrow choke on you, you know that the next day your neck is going to be messed up. <laughs> it, it feels very uncomfortable. There've been so many days where I've, I've woken up and I thought, I think I'm coming down with a cold. My throat feels all screwed up. And then I realized, oh wait, no, I'm fine. What happened was Jose tried to bow and arrow me 30 times last night. And so my throat is sore. <laughs> yeah. I think we've all been there. Oh, something that you brought up earlier too, which I think is critical. The bow and arrow is what I would call a low commitment technique. And by that, I mean, when whenever you're trying to decide what you want to do in jujitsu, I always advise people to ask themselves, out of all of the options that I've got at the table, which one is less likely to backfire on me? Yeah. Uh, as an example, if you're on someone's back, and I keep using back as an example because that is the classical, most obvious way of getting the bow and arrow, there's a lot of things you can do from there. If you try to arm bar someone from the back, I would consider that to be a high commitment technique yeah. because you're basically having to abandon the position. So if you mess up, you're probably going to wind up on the bottom or something, right? Or at the bare minimum, you might wind up on top still in side control, but you've lost the back mount. I would say that even the rear naked choke is has a bit of commitment involved because like you said, you were talking about hiding the elbows. If you try to rear naked someone, you can't really hide your elbow. That's the side effect of trying to bring your, your elbow under their chin is you're giving your opponent access to your elbow. And if they can control your elbow, it's possible that they can kind of do, um, I don't know what you call it, but it's almost like a backwards arm drag where people can yes. grab your arm and pass it around their head. Yes. I hate when people do that. And that is always the one thing that you have to factor in if you're going for the rear naked. You have to make sure that when you bring your elbow into the into your opponent's gripping range, you've got that choke and there's no way they can grab it. Whereas the thing about the bow and arrow is it is a very low commitment attack. You don't have to put your elbow into striking range of your opponent. In fact, it's even better if you can hide your elbow. Like you said, when if you want to really get the bow and arrow choke, what you want to do is you want to take the elbow of your choking hand and like tuck it so that your opponent can't even grab it. Yes. And so what winds up happening is, look, if you try it and you don't get the choke so what? You're still hanging out on the guy's back. You didn't lose anything, so you might as well try it. And I love those low commitment techniques where you can try it. If it doesn't work, you can just back out and you didn't lose anything. I think this is an aspect of strategy that we don't teach enough white belts, especially, which is, you know, they'll, they'll see a submission and they'll get almost tunnel vision about it and they'll sacrifice everything. They'll sacrifice a perfectly yeah. good mount, a perfectly good back mount because of a, you know, a, a submission that they maybe only had a 10% chance of getting. Yes. Whereas with the bow and arrow, it should almost always, in my opinion, be one of your plan A submissions from the back because look, if it doesn't pan out, you didn't lose anything. And then you can go on and escalate the commitment and go for arm bars and rear nakeds if you want. But at least if you tried the bow and arrow, if it didn't work, you didn't lose anything. And that is so important in jujitsu not to give up a dominant position once you get it. Yes, especially when we're talking about back control. You know, if we're talking about like, let's stop, talk specific rules for IBJJF, right? IBJJF rule states like, if you get to back control, top mount or back mount, right? These are three different positions in which you can score four points. There's no such thing as stalling from those points. I literally can get to get to top mount or back mount or back control with hooks in. And I don't have to do a damn thing and I will never get called for stalling. I will never get called for stalling, right? I don't have to have anything locked. It's just, just for, just for the fact that I am there. It is the obligation of the other person to try to escape, but I have no obligation to try to progress because these are the highest scoring positions, right? In, in sport jiu jitsu, at least according to the IBJJF. And there's no progressing past that point, right? Like that's the, that's the position in which you're most likely to submit a person. And if we're talking about self-defense, this is the, the position that if you get to these positions, right? And you're on the attacking side, you are in the most dominant amount of control with least likely amount of damage to you, right? It's really hard for the other person to damage you. So you want to prioritize keeping these positions. In particular, you want to prioritize keeping back control, right? They like, we say like top mount, back control, and close guard, they all have three things in common is which our legs are somewhat wrapped around a person's torso. And we're able to use that control to keep the person away from us and them in danger, right? But the biggest difference between 
close guard and top mount and, and then back control with hooks in is simply the fact that back control with hooks in, they can't see us. We're behind them. They literally, they don't have eyes behind their head. So they can't see what we're doing. So it makes it that much harder for them to, to escape and to defend anything. So you want to prioritize keeping that position. Bow and arrow is great because you can attack and sim- and and go for these submissions. But like you said, we always want to think about the ratios. And and one of my professors, uh, Professor Gustavo Dantes, like, and this is when uh, I was with him, like blue, purple, and brown, made a really good point to teach his students. Like, you want to think when when you're when you're thinking strategy, you want to think about the risk, the reward, and the success. What is the rate of risk? What is the rate of reward? And what is or how big is the reward, right? And how likely is it to succeed, right? So you have like, let, let's talk about sweeps real quick, right? If we're talking about something that is low risk, right? But also pretty low success. And the reward is you get the sweep, right? So no matter what, we're getting two points. So the reward is the reward, but what's the risk and what's the success? Like how much risk do we have to take and and how much risk is involved, right? Something low level, kind of like, like maybe like a sit-up sweep, something like that, is relevantly low risk, but sometimes low success because it's pretty easy for the person to just push you back down for as long as they're they're aware, right? And then if you think something like a scissor sweep, right, that's going to be, okay, a little bit higher risk because you have to open up a lot more, right? But you have a higher chance of getting a sweep, right, because you can kind of move them to the side. But if it fails, your ability to recover, depending on your awareness, is going to be relevantly like is really dependent on if you can recover well or not right and then you have like your other sweeps is like when they're standing up and then maybe you can like balloon sweep them that one takes literally no effort right or maybe they stand up and you grab their ankles right and you want to push them back that's like absolutely low low risk and very high success right you have very very high chance of getting that sweep with very little risk to you that's what kind of bow and arrow is right yeah. but it all happens like you have to know what you're doing right because if you don't know what you're doing then that's going to be a really high risk for you because you're going to lose position if you don't know how to keep position in the first place yeah absolutely mm-hmm. and they even did a study too of um man it was like years ago like i i can't even remember which world's championship it was but they studied all the black belt matches at Worlds. And I'd say, I think they said like 90% of the matches that reached back control, the person who reached back control won. Yep. If not won, but they also won by submission. So like needless to say, you get the back control, you want to prioritize that p- position because you have a very high chance of winning the match. And if not winning the match by points, you have a very high, high chance of winning by submission. Yes, definitely, definitely. So if we're talking self-defense, like that's a really good position that like we want to get there and we want to stay there and we prioritize that. And if you're thinking sport jujitsu or even just as a hobbyist, like if, especially if you're a smaller person, if you can get to the back, you want to prioritize keeping that back because there's very little that a bigger person can do because you're like a wet blanket or like a evil <laughs> spider monkey or whatever. Like, it's terrible. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I love what you're talking about, th- this risk reward analysis. Not enough people do that when they're trying to hold a dominant position. They just they think that all submission attempts are equal. And as soon as they say a window, they go for it. But when you want to play back mount, there's a degree of patience you have to have simply because the risk is very high with almost anything you do on the back, because if you lose the position, Man, that's a bad day at the office. I mean, I love playing mount. I know that mount is kind of a, it's sort of fallen out of vogue and everyone goes for the back now, but I love, I love playing mount. And one of the things I like about mount is it is very unlikely that if you escape mount, if you get out of my mount, it's very unlikely it's going to wind up being a terrible situation for me. I mean, yes, it is possible that if I mount you, you might hip bump me and now I'm on the bottom in guard, but that's pretty hard to do against a good person. I I don't know about you, but I find that the uh, the hip bump reversal is really, really hard to get at a, at a decent level. What I find is far more likely if I mount it on someone is if I'm forced to abandon it, then it's not the end of the world. I go to side control. I go back. I go to neon belly. I go back to mount. Now I've actually probably come out of this better because I got a bunch more points. So you can kind of surf and coast when you're playing top position. When you're on the back, though, if you screw up, 
you're probably going to wind up on the bottom in guard. <laughs> and yeah. if you're a smaller person, you really don't want that to happen. So when you're playing mount, you can afford to be a little bit looser and and transition and take a little bit more risk, I find, because you're probably not going to get reversed onto the bottom. But with back mount, you have to you have to hold on to that back mount like a monkey with his hand in the cookie jar, right? You do not <laughs> want to give it up, especially if you're a smaller person, because once you wind up on the bottom, you've given up everything now and you're back to square one. And so as a result, like you said, people understand once you get onto someone's back, you have to hold from there and finish from there and not lose the position. And so people are so good at setting up attacks from there and just never abandoning the back and chasing you, following you. I mean, if you get a high level person on your back, it, it is basically done. And for me, that's one of the reasons why I started studying the bow and arrow choke more is because I realized once you get to a decent level, I just wasn't getting caught in traditional submissions as much anymore. It was pretty unlikely that I'd get armbarred from guard or even from mount. But what I was getting constantly tapped out with was the bow and arrow because it is a very powerful back submission. It's low risk for the opponent. And like we talked about, you can score it from a ton of different positions. That's one of my favorite things about the bow and arrow is it's not just a back submission. You can chain that. And I mean, my instructor, he will set up the bow and arrow as he's passing your guard. <laughs> and, and so he can really catch you off guard, right? Because if you if you move the wrong way while you're trying to retain guard, suddenly you get bow and arrow choked. Yeah, it's like... You just have to be aware at all points. Like, and anytime it's like, especially I'm like, I see you feeding that hand, that, that lapel to the other hand. I'm like, nope, nope, nope. I don't like that. Don't like that at all. Right. <laughs> yeah. You have to, it's like, you have to be aware. But the things is like, especially when we're talking about like, all right, when I teach uh, back control, and especially when I start teaching, I start teaching bow and arrows, right? I always teach those two together. It's like, you kind of have to make the person pick their poison, right? Like, do you want to prioritize defending the choke or do you want to prioritize defending the back control and getting points? Like, yeah. it's like, or like, there's always a risk that you're going to get both. Not only are you going to get the hooks in and you're going to get your four points on me, but you're also going to get that choke. And so I, me as a person defending, I have to like, which do I prioritize? Cause it's going to be very hard to defend both at the same time. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can prioritize consciousness. Yeah. You can, <laughs> it's it's definitely not a good situation to get stuck in when you're the you're the choke e. You can attack and transition, and and like same thing that you were talking about, like mount and then back, and then like how how positions go. It's like yeah, if I'm gonna be teaching you back control, I'm definitely gonna be teaching you how to like okay, you need to switch from how to switch from mount so that you can get back to the back to back control or back mount or top mount or you know um they have a term for this whenever you go to a rule seminar or at least like if you go to rule seminar with uh one of the directors his name is uh, alvaro uh, professor alvaro mansoor right uh he's one of the directors for ibjjf for for the for the rules for ibjjf and um and he always has this joke where it's like okay four points top mount four points back mount four points back control three positions you get four points you can tr you can go from mount to back mount to back control back to mount back to back control top mount back mount back control you can go through all these three positions and continuously score four points like okay four points yeah. four points four points four points four points right and the term that they like to use they call shuhaskinu which means like little barbecue in portuguese like you're like a <laughs> like you're a piece of meat on a skewer that's just in the flame you know because you're just getting turned over and over and over again and while you're doing this so it's like again the person who's defending this is hell because like you have to like okay i don't want to be in mount i don't want to be in back control but the, all the time that you're def trying to get out of this really really bad yes. dominant position you're also a, the person's also attacking in transition they are yep. setting up that choke they are setting up that arm they are setting up that wrist but a lot of the times they are setting up trying to get to the back again which is what i like to do like it doesn't matter like if you watch how i how i how i play my jujitsu uh, close enough you're gonna see like everything leads to the back when I pass, I want to take the back. When I sweep, I want to take the back. When I'm playing guard, I, I want to submit you from the guard. But if you somehow want to escape, I'm going to take your back. Like everything leads to the back because I want to choke you from there because that's going to be the least amount of energy, right? I don't want to work. I, I like to make this joke that I'm actually very, very lazy. I'm a hard worker, but I'm a very <laughs> lazy, lazy hard worker. And I want to say that that just means I'm very, very efficient. I don't like to work harder than I need to. I want to do the bare minimum, but I want to get maximum, maximum output and results. And back control does that for me because I don't have to do that much work 
again, at least now I don't have to do that so much work. I'm pretty sure when I was a white belt, and I know when I was a blue and purple, uh, there was a, there was a lot of scrambling going on there. But once I get there, I want to chill and I want to get my choke set up and I just want you to do all the work and I want you to like burn yourself out trying to escape and then you just kind of submit yourself. <laughs> I, I, I am lazy. Okay. Bow and arrow choke is great. Like, if you know how to set things up, you don't have to put in a lot of effort and you're going to get a really, really good result. You just you just yeah. have to be aware. <laughs> I love that example you bring about like a rotisserie where you're just spinning the other person because I I mean, as a constant bow and arrow victim, I can relate to this. Right. Once <laughs> once the choke is in there pretty deep, if the person is hiding their elbow you're not going to break their grip, right? Your only option is to really try to rotate your whole body and turn into the choke. That's the only way that you're going to wind up going, getting out of there. So if your opponent is good, they're going to just keep following you. And what you wind up doing as the victim is you're kind of just log rolling on the ground, trying not to get <laughs> choked while your opponent is just, it's like a video game, you know, where you see the point score rack up four points, four points, four points, yeah. just as, as you go back to back to mount, mount back, mount back. It's, it is a very awful problem to get yourself stuck in. One of the things that is so cool about the bow and arrow choke is its ability to play into transitions like that and into attack chains. I think one of the most unique things about the bow and arrow choke is that you can basically get the choke set up before you're even in the killing position. Yes. And you don't see a lot of other submissions like this, right? You don't, if I want to get a rear naked choke on you, I'm not setting that up while I'm passing your guard. I have to get to your back first, realistically, and th control it. And then I can start thinking about getting the rear naked. But it's it's not like I'm locking up the grip around your neck as I'm, you know, passing your guard and I keep that all the way through. Whereas with the bow and arrow, you can do that. You can set up the grip in a completely different position and then transition right through so that when you get to the choking position or to the back, it's already done. And that is one of the things about it that is so unique. And I think part of the reason why you see this choke so often is because you don't need to go step one, get to the back, step two, do the choke. You can do step one, do the choke, and then step two, get to the back. And so that ability to play into sequences makes it an incredibly useful tool. Yes, I totally agree. Like, again, like once you understand how the position works, again, like, and really all you need is that you just need that cross lapel into the, into the hand. You just need to pass that lapel to the hand. Once you have that, how are you going to figure out how to make it work is up to you. Like for as long as they can't loop their head out, right? And you have your, your arm is secured right behind that neck. You're going to be able to, again, either use it as a point of a form of control, right? To, to kind of, designate where they're going to go or give them their options. I make a lot of jokes when I teach. <laughs> and one of the main jokes I made is like, I'm going to give you options. You're not going to like those options, but I'm going to give you <laughs> options. And once you put that there, it's like, you don't have too many options. I mean, obviously it's like, I want to clear the head, but if you can't clear the head, everything else is just going to be damage control. Yeah. Clearing the head is, I, I honestly find, unfortunately against most black belts, if they clearing the head is very, very hard to do because they know that that's the first thing I want to do. So usually, I mean, if you, of course, if you can clear the head, then there is no bow and arrow choke, but otherwise you fall into that trap that we talked about earlier, where yeah. you're just constantly rotating back and forth and back and forth. And then eventually they're going to grab your leg or they're going to grab even your belt or something. And then you got a, a bad, a bad day. And actually that ties into a question. What do you do with your other arm? Obviously you've got the bow arm where you're choking, but for the other one, I mean, I know there's different schools of thought. Do you grab the leg fabric or do you underhook the leg? Like some people do. It depends on how I start. I set it up from the beginning. So if I am choking on the, I guess the quote unquote choking side. So if Let's say if I'm using my left hand to choke them, if I am on the side, on the left hand side, so that my left arm is down, right? A lot of times I actually, I like looping my, my other hand behind the neck, or I can even grab the other collar and kind of finish it almost like it's like a bow and arrow, but also like a cross choke at the same time. I could do that. I lean off to the other side. So a lot of the times, like they can't really, they can't really roll away or which it leads into where I like more, which is I actually like finishing the bow and arrow when it's on the opposite side, the side that we wouldn't traditionally finish it because it's, it's actually a stronger choke for me personally. So I'm either grabbing the cross collar or I'm looping behind the head or I, I could still be holding onto the wrist. I have like, you know, I call it the Kyo grip because uh, he showed me this grip from back control uh, when I was testing for my black belt. And, um, and he had me convinced that I was the only person that didn't know what this grip was. <laughs> well, I don't know what it is. So what is what is the Kyle grip? I got to hear this now. Uh, okay. So 
Okay, so let's say that we have um, we have a seat belt grip, right? I have yeah. my left arm over your shoulder and my right arm is underneath your armpit. So that right hand that's underneath your armpit, it's going to like sneak all the way through it. And I'm going to grab your, I guess your palm, but I'm, like your palm is going to be facing forward. So what I'm trying to do is when I grab your hand, my... I aim for maybe my, my ring finger to go, or yeah, no, my middle finger to go right at where your pinky oh, meets yes, the knuckle, yeah. right? Right where it meets the knuckle of your palm, uh, of your hand. And I'm going to pull the back of your hand to touch, or I'm going to try. Obviously, some people aren't flexible enough, but I'm going to try to pull so that the back of your hand and that point of that, that pinky knuckle is going to be touching where your shoulder is. So I pull that all the way back. This is a yeah. really terrible grip, right? It's hard to break out of because you're not strong enough to push through because of how it's anchored to your shoulder. You're pulling that back of that hand to your shoulder and you're pulling back. Yeah. You don't need a lot of strength to do this. And this is only with one grip. If I had two grips, it'd be completely different. But if I have one on the my left hand on, on your lapel and my right hand here, I like keeping that. So this is going to, one, going to lead to the wrist lock later on if I have to go for it, right? If you somehow defend the bow and arrow, like you happen to loop your head out or whatever, or I just like using that. So, or if I want to loop it behind the head, it's really close to already being behind the head. So I like actually keeping, keeping that grip because it's also really hard to, to spin out once that is there. It puts a lot of pressure on that shoulder. So I'm most likely using that grip. I don't typically grab the leg anymore because I've gotten really good at um, even if they start trying to like roll out or they try going away, I just roll onto my side and they think that they can escape on that side, but they can't because again, my head's kind of blocking them and that shoulder is blocked and I still have my leg. I'll have my arm right over the shoulder and I'm choking them with my left arm, but I'll also bring my left leg over the shoulder now too. And I can finish from there. So I'll either lock my legs or I'll just kind of drive down with my heel. And I can kind of, it's almost like pulling the head out of the, and the shoulder out of the socket, right? Interesting. Did you say that you cross your ankles when you, you, you connect your legs together when you're finishing the bow and arrow? Mm-hmm. And I can do this either from traditional side or non-traditional side. I particularly do this on the non-traditional side because I can, I can drive their shoulder again. I can, it's like I'm pulling their shoulders down. But my grip on the lapel is pulling their head up. So not only do you feel the compression on your neck, but you also feel like your head is being pulled from your body. Interesting. Interesting. I'm going to have to see if I can find footage of how I'm doing that one because it's 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 very, very different. Actually, there is footage of it. I have a DVD. <laughs> Perfect. I have a DVD. I have a DVD of me doing it. But I got, like, again, like, it's a very, it's one thing to see how it's being done and a very completely different feeling to have it being done to you. I I remember like the first time I felt this, um, Kayo professor used me as his uke for a seminar in, in Portugal and everything he was doing was like, Oh, I'm in danger. I don't, I don't like this at all. <laughs> like, this is terrible. <laughs> like he wasn't even finishing the choke. Like I was already tapping and he's like, why are you tapping? I'm like, because I'm choking. He's like, I didn't even finish it yet. I'm like, but it hurts. It hurts. <laughs> and I'm choking and I don't like this. I don't like this at all. Like the moment that he like, and he didn't have to do much. He just kind of like squeezed a little bit and, or like flexed his wrist or, you know, he drove with his leg and it was just like, and I couldn't, I couldn't even tap. Like I didn't have my hands to tap with. I was like trying to find where I could tap because my other hand was so far from anywhere that I could tap. And I forgot. I was like, oh, that's right. I can, I can actually use my mouth. I tap. Right. <laughs> but there's like that, mo- that brief moment where you freak out because it's like, you don't have hands to tap with. Like one is stuck and the other one is so far away from anything that you can't, you can't tap and it's scary. <laughs> and so, <laughs> this is fascinating. I've never heard of this before. So you, because obviously when you're bow and arrowing someone, one of the most important things as the choker is you need to prevent your opponent from rotating because yes. that's how they get out, right? Mm-hmm. When you get stuck in the bow and arrow choke, option number one, the best, well, I guess actually option number one, the best option is don't let them do that. That's always the best option. Yeah. <laughs> but option number two, once you're in it is you want to try to get your head in the pocket, right? If they've got that grip around your lapel, you want to try to get your head into their armpit so that they can't actually wrap around you. But yeah. if they succeed, 
succeed in getting the grip under your chin, then you've got to start rotating. You got to turn into the choke to get out. And that's the purpose of traditionally grabbing the person's leg. Yeah. That's why you do it because they can't rotate that yes. way. But if I understand correctly, are you saying that instead of grabbing the leg, you basically get that almost like a pinky grip on the, the other arm so that they yeah. can't rotate? Yes. That's that's interesting. So mm-hmm. it's a full it's a full top side attack. You're not yes. going for their legs at all. No. What I can do though is I can also use my foot on their hip to push to angle myself. The same way that we would put the foot on the hip to angle ourselves for an armbar, I would do the same thing for this choke. So I can put my foot on their hip as well. Like my if I'm choking them with, with my left hand, left hand is is uh, secured around the neck, I can put my left foot on their hip and I'll use that to kind of push and angle myself. So now my right leg comes right across their waist and now my my left leg now right, can come over their shoulder and they'll mm-hmm. push their shoulder down. And this is where I will lock my feet most likely. So again, right. my feet are locked. My my right leg is across their waist, like a like a seatbelt. And my that seatbelt grip that I had with my arm is now replaced with a seatbelt grip, kind of like with my legs instead. Right, right. And so now I'm, yeah, I'm free to choke them. However, now this is for the, the non-traditional bow and arrow side. So this is when I'm, I'm, I'm leaning on the side where they're they think that they can escape. I have a lot of room here. So instead of like straightening my body out backwards, like leaning back, I actually crouch my body inwards and mm-hmm. I keep pulling. So it's almost like my shoulder comes into play as well too. My left shoulder is behind their neck. And so not only am I, am I flexing my wrist, I'm pulling back and I'm, I'm pulling back with my legs, but I'm also driving my shoulder behind. It's a very, very specific and very, very spe- terrible type of pressure where just everything just, it's, Everything sucks. I, I, I don't know. I don't know how other way to say that it sucks. Like I said, it feels like your head is being pulled from the rest of your body. And then at the same time, you have your carotid being, you know, blocked off, but you also have shoulder behind your neck dropping pressure in. And all I'm doing is instead of leaning back as I'm pulling myself in. So I pull myself in and then I like drive my legs down and, it, and the tap is very, very immediate. Well, this is probably a a good transition. You mentioned that, I mean, obviously, I think I kind of visualize what you're talking about here, but a visual aid is probably helpful. You mentioned you have an instructional. Where do people go if they want to see this in action? It's on uh, digitsu.com and you can either, it's either on demand, you can like direct uh, stream it, like you can get it to your phone or you can also order the actual DVD, but you can get it right onto your phone as well. So that makes it really helpful with that. And here's a good thing about this too. So if I do the bow and arrow choke on the non-traditional side, right? And for whatever reason, you try to bridge. If the person bridges to try to escape out of this bow and arrow, they just put themselves into the traditional finishing side. In which case, they still can't escape because my leg is over their shoulder. So remember, like I said, like they want to be able to clear their head out of that area. They want to get out of that pocket. But if my leg is over your shoulder, you no longer have the ability to bridge out. Right. I literally block your escape. So like now your head is on top of like my thigh, just kind of like a pillow where you're going to fall asleep. Right? <laughs> you know, it's it's funny. I always get a kick out of when people talk about like a, a pillow position where they yeah. you know, you're, you've got your bicep under the person's head or your leg under the person's head. That makes the position sound a lot more comfortable than it's actually <laughs> going to wind up being. <laughs> <laughs> like, you're going to take a nap now. It's not voluntary. <laughs> I was talking to Sonny Brown and he loves Kesakatame. And you know that variant of Kesakatame where you, you put your thigh under the person's head and then you grab your own thigh? He uh. was calling that pillow Kesa. And I was telling him, <laughs> dude, that is the least comfortable application of Kesakatame that I think I can think of. And you're calling it pillow Kesakatame. It's just a bit of a, a <laughs> conflict of expectations here because that position sucks to get stuck in. <laughs> oh, you know, anytime I start teaching back control, I, I talk about spooning. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you want to be the big spoon. You know, I'm like, I'm, I'm a little person, but I like being the big spoon. So we're just cuddling. We're just aggr- aggr- <laughs> we're just doing aggressive cuddling. That's all it is. <laughs> well, that's all jujitsu really is at the end of the day is just aggressive <laughs> cuddling with intent to choke. That's basically it. I guess I would ask just to tie this up. I mean, you sound like someone who spends a lot of time not just practicing this, but also teaching the bow and arrow. What are some of the the main key details, the main key takeaways? If you were, if you wanted to teach someone bow and arrow and you just had a very short time to do it, what are some of the main key ideas that you would want people to apply to be successful with this move? 
three things. First, make sure your grip is correct. Like when you, when you feed that lapel into your hand, you want to make sure that you have the proper grip. If you're just grabbing in, like, uh, I guess the best way to say it, if your hand looks like a beak, like a beak to grab the lapel, you're not going to be able to have a strong grip. So if your like wrist is bent, right? Yeah. Well, two things like wrist and also how your fingers are too. Like if you're not able to make a full on fist and it's not, it's not even like a full on fist, but if your hands, like if I, if I have my four fingers pinched together and then I'm just bringing my thumb to pinch it together. Like if you're grabbing the lapel like that, like you're, like you're pinching a taco, (laughs) like (laughs) that is not a good grip. Right. So, and the way to get the good grip isn't just by grabbing the lapel. You actually have to fold the lapel a certain way so that you can actually get the maximum grip on there, right? I always use the the hand that's underneath the armpit. I always use that to fold the lapel to almost like fold the the seam right right where the lapel meets the the rest of the fabric. I like folding that part inwards, and that's the part that's going to go into the palm of my hand. So I know that I'm going to be able to make a full fist to grab the lapel. Once I grab the lapel, I have to make sure that my wrist is not bent. Like you said, I cannot have a bend in my wrist. I want to try to make sure I'm actually flexing it. So always pulling so that that my wrist is is not bent towards me, but pulling away so it's straight. Next thing after that is I always want to make sure I'm hiding my elbow. So if I'm choking you with my left hand, I don't want to just pull my elbow away. I want to pull it away and I want to hide it. So I always pull the elbow back and I always like making a frame with my forearm and my, and my elbow right behind the person's back. Cause that's already a choke already by itself without adding the extra torsion. After that, it's going to be the angle. So depending on if you're going to do a traditional bow and arrow or even a non-traditional, the way that I like to do it, or I like both, you have to know which angle you're going to go. Make sure that you're angling um, so that you cut off their ability to loop their head out. That means I cannot fall into the direction of the head. I need to fall into the direction of the legs. I always have to fall in the direction of the legs. So if I have my, my left hand in choking you, I want to fall to my right side. So make sure you have a proper grip, make sure that you're hiding your elbow and make sure that you, you have the correct angle. And this is going to make your success go way up higher with the bow and arrow. If you can get these three things, it doesn't matter if you're going to be, again, traditional or non-traditional side. If you get these three things, you're going to get this bow and arrow. After that, it's just going to be all like small details. Okay, what are you anchoring to? And how deep is your grip, right, on the lapel? Because you want to make sure that it's, it's like a good good spot. But for as long as your wrist is straight, you got a good lapel and you're hiding the elbow and you're cutting the angle, it's going to be very hard for someone to defend or to escape. Yeah, those are awesome details. I mean, I I would echo that, that yes, I think that the most important thing with the bow and arrow, really at the end of the day, you need to prevent them from getting your elbow, like you said, because that's how they start to unravel the choke and you need to prevent them from rotating. Uh, You do those things and, and you're in good shape. And I love that idea of using the forearm of your choking hand as a frame kind of like digging into their into their back and into their trap it's terrible when people do that yeah. to you because like you said that in itself is enough pressure that it's going to make people feel a bit dizzy so if you can have people already being semi choked before you even lock up the full bow and arrow then you're probably in good shape going forward yes yes awesome amazing well thank you so much christina before we tie up is there anything else any closing thoughts on the bow and arrow that you wanted to share which we didn't bring up yet have try it have fun like again we've said it all throughout throughout the podcast but um you don't necessarily have to do bow and arrow from the back. You can find different ways to set it up. When I first was learning bow and arrow, I was setting it up from mount and it wasn't the prettiest, but I got the job done. So like learn how to set it up, like, and, and find ways to get to the back. I mean, if you want to be able to submit from the back, find ways to get there, whether it's from mount, whether it's from passing, whether it's from the guard, find a way to get there. And then once you get there, try it out. Like it's not much. All you need to do is just pass that pass that lapel to the to the hand and and then you're there for a good time and prioritize it you know mess around with it and and uh, and see where it takes you because there's a lot of versatility that that comes with uh, knowing how to do a bow and arrow and hey if people want to follow you or contact you how do they go about doing that best way um and the easiest and the funnest way is on instagram just at kb jujitsu can have see my 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 stupid funny reels that i like to i, I like to post your reels up. are awesome <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, I just, I, I mean, I, I don't even know what inspired me. It's just like, you know, I, I have such a perfectionist mindset that like, 
I always thought that like, oh, it has to be perfect in order for me to do it, you know? And then after a while, I was just like, you know what? Screw it. I just want to just make fun of myself or just, you know, I feel like these are all really relatable jokes. So <laughs> we're just going to put it out there. And I just stopped caring about what people are going to think about me and stopped thinking, like worrying about things being perfect. And like, we're just going to put it out there. It's a jujitsu wasn't perfect. And, you know, like neither are these reels, but whatever. If it's going to make people <laughs> laugh. Then I'm, I'm, you know, it's one of those things I didn't expect to like, kind of take off the way that it did i'm just having fun doing it and I'm, it makes me happy knowing that other people are enjoying it too yeah i would definitely recommend if i mean even if you're not into jujitsu i think you should still follow christina <laughs> just to just to see the reels because they're very relatable i think to, to even to people who haven't trained jujitsu i think they will understand the idea behind it because they're very relatable situations yeah <laughs> i try i try i'm, I'm pulling <laughs> i'm pulling from real life experience so <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And of course, to anyone out there who wants to get in contact with us, bjjmentalmodels.com is where you've got a contact form to send me an email. Also, there's a full database of all of the concepts we talk about here on the show. And of course, if you want to dig even deeper, please do consider BJJ Mental Models Premium. The website for that is premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. Tons of awesome premium audio series on there. Plus, we offer coaching services and you get access to our amazing, famous Discord community if you're part of that. So please do consider, if you're not already a member, premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. Christina, thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming by and talking about how to choke people with their own pajamas. That's always a fun thing. <laughs> it's the best thing to do, right? It's it your really is. To get to. <laughs> See, that, that's one of the main reasons why I, I love the gi so much. I don't think I could ever go full no gi because I just... I want to choke people with their pants and with their, <laughs> their their pajama top, you know? I feel like if you take that away from me, there goes one of the most fun things about jujitsu. Yes, very <laughs> much so. I totally agree. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you again so much. And of course, to everyone who hangs out with us here every week, thank you to you as well. And we'll talk to you next week. Bye.